Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us again for another episode of Leadership for the Now. My name is Florian Lungo, and I'm so delighted to be with you today. And today I'm joined by my teaching partner, Alena Ipanova. Welcome, Alena. Hi, Florian. Nice to be here with you again. Absolutely. This is almost like the, the last episode of this season, right? We're going to take a summer break. Yes. Absolutely. But we have a we have an in, interesting topic, isn't it? Yeah, we are going to talk about change and change management and how you can develop your skills and re which kind of skills are actually important in the process of change for you as a leader. Uh, so I look forward to have a fruitful discussion with you. And uh, Florin, um, I wonder what's your perspective on that actually when we talk about change, why is it important for organizations and um, what leaders should be aware of when it comes to change? Would you share yeah. your thoughts? Absolutely. I, I think we all have heard this saying that the only constant or, or, or the only certainty is change. Like in other words, things are going to change. And this is something that I learned many years ago when it comes about this, um, you know, the law of, um, there is one universal law which is called the, the law of vibration. And it says that everything around us, it's in a constant, state of change in other words if you look at the plant the tree it's either growing and developing or dying if you look at the building it's under development until it's finished to be built and then it starts degrading right you know the the walls and the, and the paint anything starts to degrade it might happen with the speed that we we cannot see with the naked eye but everything is either developing or actually going backwards so in other words there is not such a thing like inertia we cannot just keep the things just the way they are and sometimes we hear ourselves we we hear ourselves say well i just like the things the way they are well <laughs> surprise surprise or, or bad news there is no such a thing as inertia so change is, is constant and what impacts change in organizations is things like uh, evolving customer needs for example uh, technological advancement, like the AI that we see all over our social media here, and, and we see people using it for different purposes. And, and how is this going to impact our business? How is this going to impact our customer relationship? And, and uh, for example, market dynamics, you know, one product, it's, it's actually evolving in the market or, or in another one, uh, COVID-19, um, things that we cannot plan for, inflation. And, regulatory sometimes uh, the new gdpr for example and when we it was introduced it really created some change for organizations i just heard that facebook really uh, recently got a 1.2 billion dollar fine from the european union because they uh, they didn't comply with gdpr they actually transferred the data of eu user to the united states servers which means that you know all these things impact our our businesses and our organization these are from the outside, but then you also mm -hmm. have internal changes, right? The reorganization, maybe you need to rethink your, your product strategy, or, or maybe you need, uh, for example, I, I'm very familiar with the, with the automotive industry. So when regulations started to come into place that into, to ban diesel engines, for example, or, or we needed to restructure and we needed to repurpose, you know, uh, programs, skills, resources from developing those engines to maybe electrical engines right electrical motors so all these things actually um lead to change all these things impact our businesses and lead to change and i think leaders have a have a really important role in in, in change yeah thank you so much for sharing i also can relate to many of the things that you just described and just uh in the result of pandemic I got lots of companies from e-commerce uh, turning to me and asking for help because they developed rapidly. They didn't expect such a growth during pandemic and they couldn't really focus only on uh, technical aspects any longer. They needed, it was uh, an emergent need to focus on people, people development, communication, all those things that used to work really fine when they were working in smaller teams. Uh, so it all shows us that actually we can possibly get prepared for something, but it's very difficult to predict 
what's going to happen and what's the speed of change. Uh, so I do believe that there are certain things that uh, still under our control that we can actually pay attention to and uh, um, develop our skills and prepare ourselves as leaders. As you mentioned, I totally agree that leaders have uh, one of the key roles in the whole process. Uh, so um, I would suggest to talk about skills and uh, some things that we can, you know, equip leaders with or uh, encourage them to pay attention to. Yeah, How absolutely. Does it sound? Yeah, sounds great. Uh, I'll, I will just add kind of the, I think, three things that leaders are responsible for when it comes to change are, you know, giving the direction. There is no one else in the team or in the organization that could give the direction. You know, this is where we need to, to go, right? That's the direction. Mm -hmm. Provide the resources during that change. Like the leader that got in touch with you they realize, oh, my team is not resourced right now for the growth that we're observing right now in, in, in with this situation that pandemic have created, and we need help. So we need resources, we need consultants. That's why they, you know, they got in touch with you. But that's only a leader that could do to keep their team and also create kind of the environment where the team feels safe, right? That you know, this change, even if it's needed is not going to really completely disrupt the way we, we do business and, and my role. And I can see my role and my place in the new organization. I think that's one of the things that leaders absolutely have to do for their teams. Mm -hmm. And so thinking about these things, right, and maybe other things that you could add, like what would be some skills that leaders would need to be able to do these things effectively? Uh, thank you for this good question. <laughs> um, actually, what, what I'm thinking a lot is uh, mindset mm -hmm. and how we approach things, uh, what, our, what our mindset is. And uh, also, just following up on what you, uh, what you are sharing, when we talk about change, what's our attitude? Do we uh, take it as something negative when it happens? Because change is uncomfortable. And um, our brain's function is not to make us happy, it's uh, to make us safe, feel safe. So we kind of close up because uh, we want to keep at the, at the spot where we feel comfortable and we feel safe. But when change is happening, then we have to shift, we have to stretch our comfort zone, uh, start doing new things, or um, just uh, being able to see different perspective uh, becomes one of the key uh, skills in this situation so i would speak about growth mindset <laughs> it sounds possibly trivial but one thing that uh, i noticed in the organizations and uh, carol dweck actually is writing about that as well that there is such a thing as a false growth mindset when we praise the effort but not the outcome mm. and uh, we position it as a growth mindset but actually it's a false growth mindset and uh, just to give you several examples of that with diversity and inclusion, because many companies, are, you have to work with that these days. Uh, you have to check the box. What's yeah. the quality of that work? It's a separate question. But if you look at the websites of companies, uh, what they write there, uh, they're trying to raise awareness and things like that. As a new hire, you come to the company, you read all of that and you feel like, oh, wow, they are doing amazing work. When it comes to the reality that you experience, it might be absolutely different. It can be, uh, not to say the opposite, but there might be a very big gap between what is there on the website and how it is described and what employees experience in reality. So I would say developing the right growth mindset uh, would be definitely helpful. Um, and generally, people might not feel safe and it's okay when it comes to change. But I think developing a learning culture, like a culture of continuous learning in the organization is one of the keys. Then you become more adaptable, then you switch to different perspectives, you see things in different light. And this is something that helps in the whole process. Uh, so this is my take on that. Um, and true. actually I can back up this with uh, research. Uh, Deloitte um, made a research and they found out that organizations 
uh, that um, really promote and support learning, continuous learning culture, um, are 92% uh, more successful when it comes to innovation and just adapting to changes. Uh, whether it's an uh, organizational structure, whether it's something more on the um, like mental level. Uh, so this is definitely something for leaders to, to look after. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I have two things here. As you were sharing um, the, the false growth mindset, um, mm -hmm. it's also what I see when I work with organizations. Um, and, and this is also something you see in job ads. Uh, they say, well, you know, we 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 value, you know, or you should be an innovative, you know, leader or innovation. It's we, we praise innovation. But then the question that we have is like, how do you deal with with failure? Because mm -hmm. if you want to be innovative, right? And if you will probably have to try some things that will not work. And then how do you actually deal with failure? Are you praising failure? Or are you actually, maybe there will be some um, consequences for, for people making a mistake. Uh, one, of my, uh, one of my mentors actually, he's a mentor in my life, in his early, um, in his early entrepreneurial journey with, with his commercial cleaning company, he had a failure meeting. In other words, he forced his team every week to come with something at the meeting that they try and didn't work because otherwise the, he knew that is no way for us to actually cope up with with the with the level of change if we don't try new things like i know what mm -hmm. works okay so we know these things work but let's try some other things and he said well i mean you you be better come with something to the failure meeting you should not come empty-handed right because so he was forcing right this is we talk about mindset this is the you know the mindset of a leader that was preparing his team for change and, and i think when when you were sharing uh, what just went through my mind was well as leaders we have the responsibility to foresee change so in other words okay you might not be able to foresee um the pandemic although people say well this is cyclical we had the last pandemic at this time so we should expect one or if you look now and and watch what you know uh, the World Health Organization and, and Bill Gates are talking about, they're talking already about the next pandemic. So you could have some signs about that too. But, but let's say inflation or, or other, like what's the lifetime of a, of a car or of a phone? You know, a car was designed to be actually have a lifetime of seven years. So you know that people should change their car, you know, every seven years. But now it's more like the, the car is, uh, it's morally, kind of used in two or three years. So the rate of change has been, you know, much faster. I, I work with a client that say, well, our average retention time was three to four years. Now it's under two years. It's 18 months to two years. So in other words, when they were planning their turnover and, and their, you know, their staff numbers, they knew that, okay, so it's normal for us to have one or two people live every three years, but now it's 18 months. So mm -hmm. all these things are things that we could see trends and leaders should actually be able to foresee the change. Because what we discussed in the beginning was more like, these are things that impact you from the outside and they force you to change. Like the pandemic forced us to change, but Okay, we might not be able to foresee the pandemic, but what can we forecast that we're gonna we're gonna see? What can you know? I have two questions that I ask leaders. Number one, what challenges can you foresee that your team is gonna meet, but they're not fully prepared for? And and That's what the, absolutely and and this the, I mean and and I ask them purposely, can you foresee? So in other words, if you already foresee these challenges like why are you not doing something about them right and, and 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 equally what opportunities can you foresee that your team is gonna meet but might not be fully resourced to actually take advantage of like you see this ai technology 
Is there an opportunity for you to use it somewhere, but your team is not ready to do that because they're not, they're just dismissing it, right? So when I ask leaders these two questions, usually it's um, a little bit of silence because, um, well, they have to think a little bit about what that is, but when they when they see it, then they say, oh, okay, so if I can foresee this, I probably have to do something right now. So this was a, a, a long answer or a long replay, <laughs> But but I but I think these are really really critical things. Like the role of the leader in change, right, is to foresee change and to actively seek change and prepare for that change. And this is all about mindset, as you say, all about mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I really appreciate your examples here, and I want to talk a little bit about resilience as well, like the role of resilience or Absolutely. the ability to bounce back. Uh, also kind of connected to what you shared in uh, your examples that you have to develop it. This is something that um, you will benefit anyways, regardless of the process, what is going on around. If it's a slow change that it's like hardly noticeable or if it's something more rapid or unexpected, but generally developing resilience and just open up your mind to you know different things that okay it might work this way in this team but in another team they have another process so why don't i have a discussion with them instead of being critical to how i used to do things in my other team and it worked really well and so they do everything wrong so we have to change it uh, yeah. so there should be this kind of learning curve and um, experience exchange and when you mention about the retention like 18 months that it's really um it shrinks to this like little amount of time that people actually spend um in the organization um i'm also thinking about what we can actually do to um to retain people i don't like the word retain <laughs> necessarily but just to uh, to assure that people are growing and developing, but also if as leaders we see that they are not getting the right environment here for their potential, for their goals, for their growth, so possibly it's good to uh, direct them somewhere, somewhere else where they will be able to uh, reach their full potential, which yeah. is also okay. And in this case, it would be great to have network of different companies. So it's not just, uh, I think I mentioned about that already. So we all, if we take um, Gothenburg City, for instance, mm -hmm. and if we have several companies um, and leaders actually communicate with each other and they know what was going on in the industry, then they might also refer people to different positions in another company. And it's okay to do that. And then other people do the same for you. So to have this healthy uh, circle and assure that there is a good knowledge exchange within the company so that you don't um, end up with one employee in the um, like integration team. And then uh, if they leave, you basically don't have anyone who could do the job, uh, which is the case in some companies I work with. Yeah. Um, what, so. What... Uh, what you're sharing it's ideal right ideally the, the mm. leader's mindset should be that way this is kind of we call that a, an abundant mindset we know that yeah. you no know, i cannot just hold this person right because i completely agree with you um my my view is that you should not try to retain people because retaining people is almost like has a negative connotation Mm -hmm. Right. We try to create the environment so people want to stay. It's not about yeah. retention. Is almost like a negative word, right? I'm I'm holding yeah. you back, right? <laughs> so so, um, but but what you share, it's it's um it's a really a really you know good mindset for leaders and and sharing the resources. Uh, I think what what holds back leaders from uh, really leading change or, or trying to implement change or why they dread change is because there is some natural resistance to change from the leader but also from from the team and and here is where you know the leader should understand that the first answer that i'm going to get from my team is going to be no 
why are we changing? Like if, if, when it comes to cultural change, we have a model called PCIHO. And, and we usually have found that people fall into one of these five categories. The first one being pioneers, you know, the first one to change. Uh, influencers, you know, they're up there with pioneers. They influence people. Let's go. This is good for us. Uh, PCI. Uh, champions, right? So pioneers, champions, mm. influencers, obstructors, and hesitators, right? Mm. Hesitators and obstructors. So, so we know that people fall in one of these categories. So as a leader, we need to know where our people are, you know, in regard to this change. Are more of them, you know, most of them, are they for the change? So they are in the pioneer, champions, influencer categories, or are actually resisting change? And many times unconsciously, because I, I work with, with a leader that, that is preparing for, a, you know, a merge of their company with, with another one, they will be, you know, bought out. And and while the leader, it's, you know, this is a really good deal, we're gonna have a lot of opportunities, we're gonna merge with this one. People are asking, what is gonna happen with me? What is gonna mm -hmm. happen with my role? A a am I safe? Do I have a job tomorrow? Or are they, you know, the new owner uh, is gonna fire us? And, and sometimes as leaders, we see the benefits of change but we sometimes forget about the what's going on in, in our people's mind and, and what worries do they have. And that's why kind of the, the second thing that, that I, will, I will share with leaders is that um, it's really important to communicate change well. Mm -hmm. You know, every time I saw change failing is because of communication. The primary and I and I've been through change with even with, with, with large organizations in, in, in Sweden. What was lacking was the communication. The leaders assume that it's clear for everyone why we're doing this and where we're heading and how is this going to affect us. And if we can stress something, I think it's probably you can never over communicate change. I don't think I, I, I don't think you can over communicate. It's better to over communicate actually in, in this situation. And, and, and the, the, the challenge that comes with, with change that I have seen as well is maintaining performance and morale during change because change usually takes longer than we plan. And so we need to have the resources that we need to implement the change. And, and many times we need to, you know, you know, people will be discouraged because everything that is new say, oh, well, it worked with this system, but now we have this other system and you look at all these problems. And many times it's just because it's a new system and, and we don't know mm -hmm. how to do it, or it's a new way of working. And people come with a lot of questions about the new way of working and, and they compare it with the old way of working. And of course, the old way of working was stable because you've done it for five years or 10 years, right? Compared to the new one that you're trying to implement. So for leaders, they need to be aware of this. Like we tend to, overly react to, to the new, right? And and overvalue the world. And we need to know mm -hmm. this kind of, um, you know, it's like it, it, like a rubber band, right? If you don't stretch that rubber band, it doesn't have any, any, any purpose for it, right? It's only good when you stretch it. But there is a tension between the stability of the, the things that we know, right? That are staying the same and, and the potential that is actually giving the new things. So as leaders, we really need to be able to, you know, ground ourselves in the things that are not going to change and show to our team how what we change is actually going to add and benefit everyone rather than be something that it's it's put upon us. Like, you know. I like this example, Florin. And actually, it's also, it signifies the meaning of the uh, learning culture. It should be this continuous learning culture. If we have it, then it will be much easier to stretch this rubber band, right? Absolutely. So people will be more willing, even if it feels uncomfortable. And generally, employing this mindset that um, how to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. And actually, I think here is a very good um, point in our show to speak about coaching again, because coaching was our previous topic, that uh, in the process of change, coaching might be one of the key elements to support leaders in change. 
when I um, coach executives, for instance, and I can see that their transition, when they transition to a higher position, for instance, and suddenly their role changes, but their team sees them as, you know, it's my older uh, body. We like we used to do these things and uh, they used to have all the answers. So why not contacting them when I have an issue? Yeah. But they are in a different role. So it's very hard to transition. So it's not just a structural change. It's a lot about what's going on inside of us. Uh, we can change the whole structure, install a new system. But if people are not ready to handle it, if they don't have the right mindset, then um, it doesn't matter that you have the best system in the world. Uh, so uh, just employing this learning culture and uh, um, like moving forward and evolving is one of the key elements uh, in, in my opinion in the whole situation. I think you're so right, because if we have a learning culture already, then, you know, when it comes to change, we just need to learn another way of doing things to learn uh, another system or to learn an, another culture so whatever the change is right we need to cope with working remotely we need to learn how to use ai tools right so uh, i think it's critically important what you're sharing and this is the proactive part of change right if you mm -hmm. develop that mindset and uh, the growth mindset the learning culture these are things you could do proactively to prepare your team and your organization for change, right? You don't have to wait until, um, you know, something like like COVID, you know, I, I was, you know, I'm not praising myself, but I was using Zoom for, I think, two or three years before everyone found out about Zoom and, and Teams, right? You know, in, in, the, in the pandemic era. And not that um, I was visionary. I just had clients that were remotely. And I had to find a good a good tool, and Zoom was really one of the easiest to use. So, uh, but but that helped me when the change came, and I had to pivot online. You know, I I was used to do webinars, uh, and people say, well, it's easier for me to speak in front of an audience. Of course it is, right? You can see people, right? They can, you know they can smile back at you, or or they can you know give you feedback. But when you don't see people when you're on camera and you look in this lens here, you know, it's it's much harder. So uh, doing some things that were not necessarily needed, but we knew that that's kind of the future um, helped. And having this learning mindset absolutely helps. Uh, I think uh, we don't want to go over time, right? So so let's let's go through some to some um, like practical tips. I have some things here on, on my, I, I wrote down some things for us and then maybe we add to that and then we try to close uh, at 30 minutes. Let's see if, if I get that. Yeah, it sounds, <laughs> sounds good. So right. share, what do you, what do you get on your list? Yeah. What so, are those important things? So when I, when I think about the way I help leaders uh, and part of what you were sharing with coaching, it's absolutely important. Um, leaders go under a lot of stress when it comes to change and a lot of mis mis um, moving pieces of the puzzle and coaching is absolutely a resource that a uh, leader should have they should have access to a coach a mentor someone to help them uh, and when i think about how i help leaders in in times of change it's usually through uh, communicating effectively so so i help them understand that um you should probably communicate the why much often than you think. So if you get better at communicating effectively the why are we doing the change, it will definitely help. Um, building trust. Building trust with your team. In other words, like, if I don't trust you as a leader, like, how, how can I be certain that you're taking us in the, in the right direction? Think about going on a hike with someone that you don't trust. You have a guide. That you don't trust like would it be just uh, relax on the journey or or being like me being on on in a taxi or on a bus and seeing that the driver is doing stupid things for me it will be really i want to i want to take the wheel right so so people might see might, might feel that way sometimes right i want to take the wheel because you know our leader doesn't seem to take us in the right direction um empower your people to actually figure out the the how we're going to do the change. So your job as a leader is to share the the why are we doing the change, 
the what are we trying to accomplish, but then let your team to figure out the how, because um, here's what I know. It's not that people dislike change. People do not like to be changed. In other words, if you have an idea to change something and it's your idea, you're much more likely to implement it. But if I have an idea of how you can improve your communication skills, most likely you're going to reject it because it's, you know, I have an idea about how to change you. And so that's where leaders should lead by example. And if this is the new way of doing things, then the leader should be the first one doing those things and, and, and you know, changing by, by example. And I think another thing that leaders should do is to be much more available for support because that's when people have a lot of uncertainty, a lot of questions, and that's where they really need you. And when I see this not working well, was when leaders were busy with you know all the planning all the things that they need to prepare for the change but were not available for people to ask to to answer their questions and so if i would be you know sitting with someone one-on-one -on -one, i will be going through these things you know communicate effectively build trust empower your team lead by example and provide support uh, it's a good list, Florian. Um, I think I would add, like, going a little bit in depth also, just uh, building uh, relationships and understanding people, what drives them, because you touched upon that, that if change is generated by somebody and imposed on you, so we have this resistance, and uh, if it is something that you come up with, that you express, you share, you're more likely to actually uh, follow up and uh, enjoy the ride. Uh, so I would emphasize the importance of coaching and uh, not just, I'm not just talking about like employer coach and uh, do the coaching, even though we do have agile coaches that still turn to um, uh, life coaching and executive coaching because they can't manage the system. They manage the system, but they can't, you know, really tap into like mindset, work with that. Yeah. So they go and they look for those competences. But I'm also talking about leaders, how you develop your um, coaching style as a leader, uh, just with the questions that you ask, just uh, with the way uh, you communicate. And we talked a lot about communication and uh, the role of emotional intelligence, cultural intelligence in the process. So it's not just what does it mean to have effective communication and open communication from my side as a leader, but checking in with people and knowing what works for them, uh, to which communication style they are more perceptive, uh, how they you know, respond to, to that, how to find the way. So it's a lot about relationships and understanding. Uh, the better the connection is, uh, the easier and smoother the whole uh, change. It's not like about not having, you know, downs in the process. It's about ups and downs, but you'll be able to get through it um, to race to a new level uh, with uh, uh, at, at a lower price, I would say, uh, in terms of, you know, how people feel emotionally and how involved they are. Yeah. And so, uh, Absolutely. I completely agree with you. Uh, and that, that's critical for leaders to know their people, because then you know each person's resistance to change. Like if you know them and their motivation, their personalities, if you have done some, some work like to really, you know, know each other as a team, then you kind of know who's going to be excited about the change, who's going to be maybe scared about the change. And then you as, you, as you mentioned, like, you know, coaching each of them individually to be able to navigate the change. Yeah, so I think this is a good wrap up for yes, uh, for this uh, conversation. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I, I will only want to add kind of two things. Whenever I talk to leaders about change, two names come to mind. Number one, it's Nokia. And, and we talked mm. a little bit before going live about, you know, many years ago, how many of us had a Nokia phone? You know, when I ask this in a room, then many hands go up. Well, how many of you have a Nokia phone today? Um, almost no one, right? Because they didn't see the change coming. And not the other name is Kodak. I, I used to have, you know, um, photo camera Kodak. And Kodak didn't think that digital cameras are a thing. 
until Digital Camera were the only thing. And now they're still mm. with, the, with the films and, and, and they kind of, they have a small you know, market share in a niche now that is people still looking for those way of, of taking photos. But digital cameras, you, you will not gonna find a, a good you know, Kodak camera. So these are two examples that you know, just remind us of how we didn't see the change and the change happened and we didn't make a shift. So I hope this gives um, you know, leaders some urgency to really prepare <laughs> for the change. Definitely right? creates. <laughs> exactly, to really prepare for the change. All right, I think this is, this is a wrap, right? Yes. Yeah, okay, good, perfect. All right, so we're gonna have um, a break, at least we know that June and July, we're not gonna have a live show. Uh, we're gonna let you know if we resume in August and what we do, but uh, until then, we wish you a, a fantastic summer. If have any question or anything, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we'll be more than happy to help. Thank you, Florian. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy your summer break. Absolutely. All right, take care. See you soon. Bye-bye.